Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street, London, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Richard Vincent. Richard is um, part of an organization called the School of Life. They've written a series of fascinating books. Uh, one of the most recent is called On Mental Illness. So this book um, is a very unusual book, in my opinion, in that it attempts to um, help people think about mental illness and how to look after themselves and give some very interesting um, general guidance. Obviously, mental illness is a very controversial territory. So I have no doubt, while there's much that I agree on in this book, uh, Richard and I are also going to have a, a lively conversation <laughs> about some of some of the elements of the book. But first of all, Richard, congratulations on the book. It's, it's beautifully written, and I think it will be helpful to many people. But I feel that one of the starting points is the very private nature of mental illness, and therefore it's almost secret nature. You're, you're, you're reaching out to, I think, you must correct me if I'm wrong, millions of people who may be suffering but who may not have gone for professional help. And it feels to me that one of the, the gaps the book is trying to fill is this essential private nature and the fact that people may be suffering. They may recognize their suffering, but may not have done anything about it, or they may be getting inadequate help, or they may not even recognize actually what's going wrong as they're suffering from a mental illness. Could you say something about that? Yes, yes, and uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, uh, and. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be on the show, and if, uh, uh, it's such a good timing um, following the uh, Mental Health um, Awareness Week last week. So um, I think, you know, broadly speaking, the School of Life um, uh, writes with a sort of common voice with a team of writers, and um, they hold some things in common, uh, one of which is just the normalising of emotional distress and mental illness. Um, as you rightly said, I think a lot of people do um, go through periods where uh, they could justifiably consider themselves mentally ill um, and also emerge from it. Um, it, it it's not necessarily a, um, uh, what's the word, a sort of uh, a jail that there's no escape from. It's something that we, um, as part of the normal course of life, um, enter and also emerge from. Um, so I think that's um, that's part of the, the ethos, of, ethos of the book and the School of Life in general. And one of the things the book is 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 talking about, about how to look after yourself when you're not feeling very well at all. Now, one of the interesting things about mental illness, and you allude to this in the book, is the notion that when you're mentally ill, you're completely out of control. And you and I both know that's not true at all. In fact, there's a lot that you still are in control of. And you're arguing there are many things you can do to look after yourself. Um, there are things you can watch your diet. You, you can look at the lifestyle that you lead. And one of the things is you can think about your approach to yourself. So one of the key issues, it seems to me, that comes up in the book is the attitude to mental illness. So one of the things you're advocating is more acceptance of extraordinary or extreme mental states. Could you say something about that? Yes. Um... I think um, uh, uh, as you well know, um, we consider our minds um, and our attachment to reality as something um, something to be taken for granted. Um, but actually it varies enormously um, uh, from person to person and at different times and in different contexts. And at times we do experience quite extreme emotions um, it might be that we need help, um, but it's also part of the normal sort of course of human existence, if that makes sense. Um, and I guess uh, the different areas that are um, highlighted in the book, there are 14 areas where um, uh, there are suggestions that we could consider um, uh, making ourselves feel better. Um, some of them are quite... Um, uh, sort of medical, you know, in the area sort of medication, uh, psychotherapy. Others are more cultural, uh, others are more physical. Um, but I think it's sort of to try and take the entire um, uh, experience of illness um, and understand that it can be, um, you can, we can still have a sense of agency within it and sort of holistically try and improve things. Um, we can still have 
a hot bath and put lavender on our pillow and also take antidepressants in order to stabilize things or we can um, make sure that we're eating well and also attend our therapy sessions they're not either or we can sort of um, be involved and directors of our own recovery well, the directors of our own recovery is a very interesting phrase. I want to pick up on that. And I think it's a very important phrase. And I agree with you. One of the philosophies I think is embodied in this book, which I'm a strong believer in, is that although I'm trained in medicine, I'm a qualified doctor, and I'm trained in psychiatry, um, the Western medical model um, for most medical disorders, like a urinary tract infection, is that the patient is largely passive. The patient turns up at the doctor, the doctor gives them an antibiotic, and all the patient really has to do is let the te medical technology do its work. I believe there's a big difference with mental illness, and I think your book captures this point. You are going to have to be, to a much larger extent, the architect of your recovery, even if you're taking medicines or seeing a psychotherapist. And I think that's a big, big misunderstanding from patients and practitioners. The treatment is largely going to really be administered by the patient to themselves. And your book provides some interesting guidance on that point. But what are your thoughts about that particular point? There is a distinction with mental illness compared to the other illnesses in that the patient is going to have to be the author of their own recovery much more, perhaps, than with other disorders. I think I agree, and I think that's part of the reason um, uh, the mental health professions has uh, considered, re-evaluated the whole um, usefulness of um, illness um, and describing whether um, somebody uh, who's experiencing emotional distress is ill or not. Um, I think that there are times when um, there is a line that people cross, whatever that line is for themselves, where they no longer feel like they can function enough. Um, but I think um, uh, there's probably a number of approaches, but one approach is to sort of say that nobody's ill um, and that everybody experiences emotional uh, distress in one way or another. Um, and the other way is that um, uh, lots of us are um, ill at different times. It is uh, more normal than any of us would like to admit publicly, but I think uh, yourself and myself, you know, we see all sorts of people. Um, the psychotherapy team at the School of Life sees all sorts of people who um, uh, are struggling emotionally um, uh, and can be classified as ill. Um, and it's not something to be, uh, almost to be sort of ashamed of, it's something that you can feel, right, I'm going to do something about this. It might be a small step, it might be a large step, um, but it's still my life, even if I'm not feeling quite myself. So um, on that point, the notion um, that we have to look after ourselves um, is very important because the passivity that the professions and um, the system um, tend to producing patients means they go to the doctor, the GP says, there's a six week waiting list for you to see your CBT therapist. And the patient waits around for six weeks, believing treatment will start in six weeks. One of the ideas I think that's in this book, and I'm a strong believer in this, is that you shouldn't be waiting six weeks to look after yourself. You can begin looking after yourself almost straight away. Um, could you say something about that? Yes, yeah, it, it follows, um, it, it's a, um, a really good point, it follows on from what we were talking about really. I think um, uh, sometimes um, clients, when they believe that they're ill, be believe that treatment has to, has to start a little bit like if they had tonsillitis or, or, or something like that, but they're almost waiting for the prescription from the doctor for their antibiotics, whatever it is. Um, but actually, rather like that case, there's no reason why you can't begin the process of making yourself feel better. Um, and um, the efforts that you make won't be, um, uh, won't be sort of rendered um, uh, unhelpful when you start your therapy or your treatment or whatever. Um, uh, you can try, you can experience, Experiment. You can see the things that work for you. On top of the evidence base uh, that you know therapists can um, can help with. 
Now, a really interesting um, deep paradox that your book touches on, which I've seen very rarely touched on properly, is at the heart of mental illness, serious mental illness, and even maybe milder forms, is that our minds become unreliable. So let's take an example. You suffer from, let's say, obs severe obsessive compulsive disorder. You're convinced every time you touch a doorknob, you're going to catch a germ and you're, you're going to get disease and it will kill you. Right. So touching doorknobs mm -hmm. becomes a high stakes life and death situation. So you don't touch doorknobs. Um, you don't shake hands with people. You're very worried about germs. And eventually, maybe you stop going at all. And the most famous example in history of this was Howard Hughes, the famous billionaire who actually died in the end because he was so afraid of catching germs that he didn't, his team didn't call the doctor out when he was ill and savable from a physical disorder. So there was a paradox there. Um, now, um, what you're saying is you need, as part of looking after yourself, to recognize that if you're suffering from severe OCD in this particular example, your mind may be reliable, and it, this is true, that you can get to work all right, and you can make the train timetable work for you, but your mind becomes very unreliable in a particular domain, which is germs and disease. So recognize, is one of the really interesting ideas in this book, recognize where your mind is reliable, but recognize when it's unreliable and actually don't pay attention to it or be able not to pay attention to it in certain domains. And I think that's a really interesting idea. And I think it goes to the heart of mental illness that a lot of people don't realize that most mental illnesses, you, there is a, there are areas where you become unreliable. You can become paranoid or morbidly jealous that your partner's having an affair and uh, you're looking for evidence and every small bit of evidence is, is, is making you anxious. But you can be going to work and running a major bank completely okay. But in this area of paranoia, you're in real trouble. So could you say something about that notion that the mind, A, the mind becomes unreliable, but it's unreliable in particular domains, and you need to recognize where it's unreliable and actually not pay attention as much as you might otherwise do to things your mind is telling you in certain areas. Could you say something about that? Yes, very much so. It, it, it sort of touches on an area, um, sort of more acceptance-based, um, not quite mindfulness-based, but um, that sort of idea that um, uh, we do have quite, uh, sometimes quite wild parts of our minds, sometimes quite wild thoughts. Um, of course, it's difficult not to get hooked into them, um, but if we can let some of them pass through, um, there's a good deal of functionality around, and sometimes that functional part of ourselves can help with the bit that is become unpredictable or become troublesome. You know, the part that makes us breakfast, wakes us up, maintains a routine, can help um, soothe the part that is feeling really out of control and quite sort of um, uh, quite emotional, quite upset. Um, so I suppose um, uh, it's not an easy skill. Uh, I, I don't think the book pretends that it's easy. I don't think I would. I'm sure you wouldn't either. Um, but it is a, a skill that's worth, uh, worth learning. And it becomes more and more apparent uh, in some ways the more extreme our um, uh, illnesses are, I think. But one of the distinctions between people who are still accessible is at least their recognition that there are parts of their mind that might be unreliable. There, there are people who are so ill, they don't see that that, that, that bit is, they, they believe there's a complete um, 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 continuity between their reasoning ability about the CIA following them, for example, and their yes. beliefs about getting the right train to work. They see no distinction whatsoever. Whereas, whereas many other people can see, well, OK, I, I think I'm pretty confident that I'm, I'm, I'm not dysfunctional when it comes to catching the right train to work. But maybe this whole thing about the CIA following me and being out to get me, I accept is slightly different. Um, while I still believe it, I accept there's something different going on there. And that's a key point, isn't it? To the ability to at least understand where your mind is operating in a slightly different way to the way it does in, in other places. And the recognition that there's at least there's a possibility of dysfunction, I think. What do you think? Yes, yeah, I think that's true. I think the, um, uh, the example you gave with OCD is a really good one. Um, it's actually a relatively small um, uh, component of the overall uh, uh, aspect of living, whether or not uh, one can use a door handle, for example. Of course, it's important, but it's you know, it's relatively small, but it begins to assume a sort of over overpowering prominence in the mind, doesn't it? And it? The whole of life becomes that. 
Um, and I suppose the example you gave with more severe illness, I, I guess you're sort of alluding to things like sort of psychoses and, and that kind of uh, uh, emotional distress. I mean, much of the work, is, it's not a, an area of specialty for me, but I have a little bit of experience with it. Much of the work actually is those sort of areas where there is some attachment to a sort of reality, just gradually growing them. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so that over time, the area that is sort of paranoid or whatever it is, um, becomes balanced out by a more kind of realistic uh, view of life and suddenly you know, life begins to become more functional and then hopefully some of that psychotic thinking begins to, you know, diminish. Now, you blame several things on why we may be more prone to mental illness today than in the past. And mm -hmm. one is the notion in the book of this thing called modernity and what modernity <laughs> means. Yes. Yes. Um, and one of the things you're talking about with modernity is the notion that we um, should always be striving um, for more and to be better. Now, we, we've touched on this point in another book of the School of Life called A Simpler Life. Um, yes. And you seem to be um, drawing on some of those ideas here a little bit. But I was very interested in the notion that you seem to be arguing that to some extent mental illness or proneness to mental illness or more mental illness is embedded in some of the concepts of modernity. So you talk about the fact that um, hundreds of years ago, people went to church every Sunday and um, being in the presence of God, um, on, on, omnipotent being, created a certain humility and also a, a certain acceptance of, of the troubles they were in the world. Um, and yeah. modernity means we don't believe in God anymore. We believe our, in ourselves. And therefore, we put ourselves under pressure all the time um, to be doing more um, and to be more ambitious and to be more successful. Um, so we, we take more responsibility for our lives than maybe um, uh, people did in the past, um, but also we're flogging ourselves to death because we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people and, and trying to do better. So the notion um, which you're advocating, and I'm going to take issue with you a little bit in a moment, but was also <laughs> in the school of life, that we shouldn't try always to be living in very expensive houses in the middle of cities and going all, all the time to everything, um, et cetera, et cetera, that you could lead a quieter life, a less ambitious life. Here's the key point coming up, a less successful life and that might actually lead to more uh, mental well-being. It's a very interesting idea, uh, I think, at the, at the heart of this book. But one of the key points is you're also saying we need to take responsibility for our lives. We need to take responsibility for our ambitions. And this is true in my private practice. I work in Harley Street, so I see many high net worth people who um, arrive and clearly they're putting themselves under stress because they're so ambitious and they're climbing the greasy pole. And I say to them, you've got to take responsibility for the fact that it's you who've decided that you want to be running this major bank by the age of 36. You know, you don't have to, believe it or not. You don't have to do that. You can't. And it's really quite amazing when you tell people you don't have to do that. That's a choice you're making. And it is entirely possible to construct a perfectly reasonable life whereby you're not ultra successful. How strange the looks you get from people, because it's a very unusual idea. Um, and, you know, doesn't seem to be discussed widely. The notion of choosing less success is a viable choice. Um, could you say something about that, if you agree with that analysis of, of what you're trying to say? I do agree with it, yes. Yeah, I think um, uh, perfectionism, high standards um, uh, are, um, are rife in, um, uh, in modern society. And I think um, neither of us are saying anything revolutionary by acknowledging that that's a sort of widely acknowledged thing. But I think um, there's a discrepancy, isn't there? We talk about living a simpler life and not trying to put too much pressure on ourselves. But then we also receive images which sort of reinforce the fact that we should live a uh, more successful life and keep striving. Um, and it becomes quite difficult sometimes to hold both those, um, both those things, because sometimes they're just in conflict, aren't they? Um, so I think um, uh, the whole idea of success um, is something that uh, I think it can be looked at. Um, quite often we look at it when some uh, tragedy befalls us or when some big event happens in life uh, and it allows us to sort of reevaluate our perspective and we go and buy a vineyard or we 
well, it's not oil painting or whatever it is. Um, I think um, uh, it would be nice if we could try and, um, as you're doing with your clients, try and encourage people to reevaluate those priorities a little bit earlier. Um, can we be a head of a bank four and a half days a week and on the half day do the thing we always dreamed of? Maybe we can't, but at least it's worth considering. And it, and it lets you reevaluate pressure and success. You know, it, it's not possible. Yeah, but I, th I would argue there's a slightly nuanced, subtle distinction between your position and my position. I'm not advocating to the people who are trying to run the bank by the age of 35 that they stop doing that. I'm saying hmm. the reason you're under stress and the reason you're anxious is tied in with your ambition. So take responsibility between the, the link between the two. If you want to continue being this ambitious, accept the price you pay, right? Don't come to me and believe you can receive treatment to become a calmer, less tense individual and still want to be this ambitious. The two things are closely tied. So I'm not telling them don't do it. I'm saying take responsibility for your decision and understand the consequences. And it's just impossible uh, for the, this idea that you will get elsewhere in Harley Street. A therapist says, oh, well, I can cure you. Uh, we'll light a candle. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll um, give you a massage and you'll be fine. You won't be fine if you if basically you continue um, with these um, success obsessions, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm saying is make your choices. I'm not telling you which thing to choose, but understand the consequences of your choices. I think your position is actually trying to advocate a little bit more. And I may be being unfair to you. The idea mm -hmm. that a less successful life is in some sense a better life in terms of mental health. I, I'm not quite saying that. I'm saying people are, need to understand the consequences of their decisions. Uh, yes, you're right. There's a, um, uh, there is a difference in those positions. I'm not, think, I'm not sure I'm quite saying that. And the, the, um, uh, the clients who come to the School of Life um, are very often quite sort of motivated and quite, um, uh, quite, uh, hmm. Driven to to succeed, I suppose. Um, uh, so, so again, going back to the example that, that, that you raised, I think um, the idea that uh, um, you choose uh, a particular path, um, I think, is um, uh, is a very strong one. But I think, um, it, just like anything, if you don't have any agency and you're not feeling like it really is a choice. Um, if you're um, uh, head of a bank, um, feels like he has to do that. He doesn't want to, um, but he's sort of coming with, coming to you with the idea that in some way he's sort of almost trapped. Um, he's not, there's a, there's a variety of ways to live a successful life. His is one way or, she, or hers, um, but there are also other other ones that might work for them and provided they've sort of evaluated everything then you know if it turns out that they're sometimes tired it might be okay in in relation to their sort of desire and motivation to succeed it might be an okay trade-off it might not be though of course and, and they need to be able to choose i think Yes. Well, I mean, we'll, get, we'll do a bit of a philosophy here. And I, I think the School of yes. Life is very interested in the application of philosophy yeah. uh, to everyday life. Um, so it, it, one of my favorite films, Jerry Maguire, a Cameron Crowe movie, Jerry Maguire plays a sports agent played by Tom Cruise, who is um, at the beginning of the film, terrifically ambitious. So these sports agent represents sports stars who are earning millions of pounds. And the, the, the notion of, of the sports agency is they keep encouraging the stars to chase after bigger and bigger contracts. And many of the stars yes. burn out as a result. And Jerry has a moment of epiphany and writes a memo uh, at a junket where all the sports agents are, suggesting we should have fewer clients, less money. And the inevitable happens and he gets to sack. Um, and um, um, throughout the film, it follows his journey. Um, they, they, they intersperse cuts with... Um, the person is meant to be Jerry's agent um, um, mentor from when he was much younger and starting out in sports agency. And this guy is an old school guy who is actually less um, into the money and says some wonderfully um, um, calming and reassuring things, despite the fact it's a cutthroat uh, industry they're in. But one of the great lines is this mentor says, I love my wife. I love my life. And that's my 
definition of success. So it's a lovely idea that one of the things you have mm. to think about when you're chasing success is what is your definition of success? If your definition of success is to have five Maseratis in the garage, fine. But if it means you're having a nervous breakdown and your children hate you because they never see you or whatever, then own your definition of success. You know, we think clearly what your definition is. And I think that's an issue that is at the heart of mental illness. Think clearly about what your goals are, right? And, and therefore understand the journey that you're on. I think you're also trying to say that. You're trying to say that sometimes people run into trouble because the trouble is embedded, in a sense, in their philosophy of life. And, and be, be aware of how you can end up causing yourself trouble through having a philosophy that lands you in trouble. I don't know if that would be something that you would agree you're trying to say. Yes, I think so. I think the, um, uh, the idea that uh, thinking about these sort of high level things is a sort of a bit abstract and we just need to get on with the um, uh, with the business of life and succeeding sort of in a kind of day-to-day -day way. Um, if you um, uh, are not happy or, or if you've had a kind of nervous breakdown or some kind of um, emotional sort of explosion that sort of brings life to a, to a stop, um, it's okay to consider sort of uh, in a very practical way, um, how does my vision of a successful life filter down into what I'm having for breakfast or what I'm doing during the day. You know, there is a relationship between those. I think the School of Life uh, uh, is, is, is very keen to sort of um, make philosophy and these sort of more high level values based um, decisions, something that is quite practical, something that's quite attainable, that can be just sort of talked about in a useful way. You know, maybe I will, Maybe it was a good aim to have five Maseratis by the time I was 35. I'm 34, I no longer want five Maseratis. It's okay to be nimble and change a little bit if it doesn't work. So um, one of the other things that's very interesting about this book and unusual is you focus a little bit on sleep. And I agree with you that people don't realize sleep is a very good indicator of your emotional state. And a lot of people don't realize that. And one of the other important notions about mental illness is you could be suffering from a mental illness and don't realize it. That would be very unusual for, for many disorders, medical disorders that create symptoms, like, you know, um, um, uh, coughing up blood in the morning. If you cough up blood, you're pretty clear that something's not quite right, and you might take yourself off to the doctor. But you could have quite troubling symptoms with mental illness. I've seen many people who've been hearing voices for years, for example, who didn't think they had a mental illness, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a very important idea here. How do you know you've got it when there's no blood test? Okay. And everyone's thinking to themselves, I'm crazy. But everyone, given everyone thinks that everyone else is maybe thinking that, how do I know that my level of craziness is actually something that requires some kind of professional intervention? Now, one of the things you do mention in the book a bit, and I thought I was very impressed with this bit, is the area of sleep. One of the reasons why sleep is a very sensitive indicator is when you wake up at three in the morning, you haven't got the distractions uh, of the day and you're just alone with yourself. And that's a good test of whether that's a stressful experience or not a stressful experience. Mm. And I'm also very impressed by how people turn to chemistry over and over again to try and fix the sleep problem without thinking harder about what's going on, because something else is going on that needs addressing. And one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the Western world are drugs that help people sleep. Um, and they're, it's very interesting how they want something delivered. They want sleep delivered. They don't care how it's delivered. They want it delivered through chemistry rather than thinking, if I'm having trouble sleeping, that means something's not quite right somewhere in my mental equilibrium or my mental state. And I think it's one of the, one of the, one of the, the most sensitive indicators of emotional and mental health, the ability to sleep well and sleep without AIDS, but also the ability to fall back to sleep unaided when you wake up, as we all do from time to time in the early hours of the morning. Could you could you say something about that? Yes, yeah. I think um, uh, trying to range your areas that you consider in recovery from the abstract in terms of the values and what constitutes success, how you spend your time, to the very detailed and concrete in terms of what you eat and how you sleep um, is a sort of sensible, holistic way of uh, taking care of yourself compassionately. And I think sleep in particular, um, uh, 
you all know this, um, uh, as well as uh, myself and the rest of the psychotherapy team do. Um, it's not always easy to fix, but it is a good indicator when things are out of equilibrium. Um, and I think um, um, trying to pay attention to some of these sort of signals um, and then look around our lives and think, okay, what, what can I do? Um, what's amiss here? What, am I under too much stress? Is something um, in need of attention? Um, and if it is, what should I do about it? I mean, there's some other concrete areas too. Uh, as psychiatrists, and indeed um, ourselves, often use this in, in the um, initial consultations we have with people. Digestion, uh, you know, the sort of uh, that whole relationship with food. It tends to go out of balance, doesn't it, when our emotional system is out of balance. Um, energy, concentration, there are some really sort of, they're not always easy to kind of score, um, but they are good indicators that there are aspects of our lives that need attention. Um, does that uh, cover some of your question? Yes, so, but the other thing that's unusual about your book is you focus on love as well, as very deeply oh, entwined yes. with the notion of mental illness. I think it's a fascinating idea. It's very unusual. Most books on mental illness don't lay the blame at the door of love, um, but you do to some extent. I know I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying your position a little bit there, but I want to go back. You, you focus on sleep, which is an unusual focus, um, but the correct focus, I think. Um, a lot of people don't realize it's a good sensitive indicator. Um, I also, by the way, think that one of the things we, we should say before we get back, we, we get on to love and before people are overly preoccupied sometimes with having great sleep, which is one of the reasons why they want to throw chemistry at the problem. It, it is fine. I mean, as a junior doctor, we often went days without sleeping. So you become more used to the idea that just because you don't sleep, it doesn't mean there's going to be a catastrophe the next day. But sometimes people get a bit obsessed with the idea that a certain number of hours sleep is absolutely essential. And when they don't do that, they get very bothered about it. And that paradoxically leads to insomnia. Um, insomniacs are often obsessed to overmuch with the idea of a certain amount of sleep is absolutely essential. So being relaxed about sleep, paradoxically, tends to help you sleep better. And it's one of the inherent paradoxes often at the heart of, of psychological dysfunction. Getting obsessed with sleep makes you less likely to sleep. Being relaxed about sleep, at least for the first few days when you're not sleeping, is more likely to deliver sleep. Would, would you agree with that analysis? Yeah, I think so, yes. I, I, um, uh, I feel like I should find something to disagree with you about. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you're feeling a I pressure, will, will, a modernity, that you're an intelligent person. You're an intelligent person if you disagree. <laughs> um, That's the pressure of modernity yeah, yeah. right there. <laughs> yes. um, I attended a workshop uh, about a year ago or so, um, and um, uh, by a neuropsychologist, um, and um, uh, they made the very relieving point, I think, that most of us wake up 10 to 15 times a night anyway. Um, so when you're having a bad night's sleep, um, it's not sort of uh, a kind of perfect system that breaks. It's already an imperfect system. Uh, and most people can sort of get through the day, even though you can feel tired. Of course, if we're having an emotionally difficult time and our sleep goes, then, you know, life can become quite hellish. So it, would be compassionate about that um, but there's also something relieving about the fact that people rarely die from not having enough sleep um, you know we can get through the day and we can go to bed early the next day and it's okay yeah there, there is a very interesting, interesting evolutionary psychological approach to sleep which points out that given we evolved to live in much different environments, what's famously called the evolutionary psychology ancestral environments, uh, than the 21st century world that we live in now. We, we evolved to live in an environment where we were living in a jungle or sleeping in a jungle or in a cave, and there were predators around. So it didn't make sense, actually, from an evolutionary standpoint, given you're very vulnerable as an animal when you're asleep, to being attacked and then killed without being able to defend yourself. To, to actually fall into that deeper sleep for, for a huge number of hours. We're, we're evolutionally designed to have fitful sleep, which is to wake up every now and again to just to check we're not, we're not in danger. And it mm -hmm. makes evolutionary sense then from an evolutionary psychology standpoint that when we're under stress, because the nature of stress would have been, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, 
that we were in danger from a physical threat, that we should actually be more jumpy when we're asleep. It would make evolutionary sense. Obviously, in the 21st century, we don't face the same kind of predatorial threat. So it doesn't make sense to have jumpy sleep, but it kind of makes sense if it's a hangover from an ancestral environment time. So again, that's an attempt, which is what I think you're trying to do in your book, is normalize things that look to many people as really abnormal and you should panic about. You're trying to, to, to some extent, normalize experiences. There's the mental illness or there's the phenomenon people experiences. Then there's their attitude to it, which is often more of the problem than the actual initial problem. Their, their attitude of it is to be condemnatory or, or to panic about the fact they're having some experience. Could, could you say something about that? Yes, yeah, and um, we can come back to love um, at some point, but um, uh, I guess the um, uh, the basic idea that uh, these relatively simplistic things uh, can provide sort of scaffolding in life um, and that they can help us when life is difficult and we're feeling uh, fragile or wobbly for different reasons, uh, whether it be sleep or eating or... Um, uh, mild exercise. Um, these are all things that um, uh, can be sort of incorporated. Um, they're not too basic uh, to make us feel better, quite the reverse. They're quite sophisticated. Um, and actually, sometimes getting lost in uh, existential concerns without paying attention to what's in front of us um, can lead to quite unhelpful outcomes. Likewise with the reverse, you know, trying to pay attention to the whole uh, the whole picture of um, what we're experiencing uh, and just sort of make adjustments all the way down until we get to a point that we're feeling better. I think um, the book advocates and um, I think makes just sort of general holistic sense really. So let's talk about love. You, you lay the blame for a lot of mental illness. I know I'm simplifying your position um, to, to, to maybe over-dramatize it um, at the door of love. You say love is really at the heart of practically every mental illness, even if it's not apparent at, at first glance. Tell, tell us a bit more about what you mean by that statement. Well, I guess it depends um, what, what we mean by love. But I think uh, the book and probably the School of Life in general um, uh, has quite a broad definition of love. It's not just a sort of uh, romanticized Hollywood version. Um, it includes things like unconditional approval, uh, uh, patience, <laughs> very crucially, um, uh, some kind of um, loyalty, reassurance, all these kind of things. So it's not just that kind of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, connection between two two lovers in the heat of their, um, uh, in the heat of their courtship, perhaps. Um, I think um, if we have a good deal of love, whether it be parental or from a partner or from friends, um, we can withstand an awful lot during life. Um, we have the capacity as humans to sort of really quite uh, expand and endure, actually. And likewise, when that has, um, disappeared for different reasons, um, we can become really quite fragile. Um, that's something that, that I think, broadly speaking, I think both psychology, psychiatry um, have, I, I think experienced and good clinicians all know that, uh, but it's not always particularly easy to sort of measure, if that makes sense. Um, I think um, some concepts, things like attachment and that kind of thing, um, almost have a sort of, uh, some of the bare bones of that idea of, a, of love, but just sort of a few of the romance elements sort of stripped out, um, or, or, or a few of the sort of glossy elements sort of stripped out. But the actual idea that we need to feel cared for, um, and when we do, uh, it makes us be able to recover quicker, um, is, um, it, I mean, it's so crucial, it's, it's almost, the most crucial aspect of, of what makes life worthwhile, isn't it? I think. Yeah, but this comes on to another point. Now, this is where um, I su suspect um, we, we are going to have a fight um, intellectually, <laughs> which is okay. that um, 
uh, which seems to be important that we do. Um, um, uh, we're, we're, we're the starting point of where it all goes wrong, in, in my opinion, just my opinion, um, it all begins to go wrong in a slightly different location. You, you, your view, it seems to me in the book, it, it begins to go wrong inside people's heads, right? That's the location of the of the, the, the starting point of the fault. To my way of thinking, we are born into the world and we need things from the world. We need love, popularity, money, the stuff we want from the world. Unless, you, unless you're born, luckily enough, a billionaire, in which case you, you already have everything and you just buy everything. Okay, And even those people, because I've seen them in my practice, end up in trouble precisely because they never had to work for anything. And that that's, leads to equal dysfunction, yeah. believe it or not. Anyway, so we need things from the world and, and we go to school and we learn stuff. And what we're trying to do is learn how to get on in the world and be in the world, right? So we see someone attractive in a bar and we desire them. And the task at hand is to get them to desire us, okay? We, we see a Ferrari or we see, I don't know, a Buddhist monastery and we want to go there. And we need to work out how to get there or how to get these things. It doesn't matter what we want, but we need things from the world. And in order to do that, we need to give the world something, okay? We may have to work hard or or entertain the date that evening. We have to give the world something. So the transaction, okay? We give the world something, and then the world gives us something back. And where actually things begin to go wrong is in that area. I, in my view, mental illness arises because people want something from the world. They get frustrated because they can't get it, because their way of going about getting it is utterly dysfunctional. And and they 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 stalk people when they when they want to have a relationship when stalking leads to the opposite outcome. Okay, so sto stalking yes. would be a good example. I've written a book about stalking, um, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. They they want to stay alive and they want to be healthy. They don't realize they're going about it in an utterly dysfunctional way. That the, the way to be healthy is not to avoid going out because you're worried about touching um, door handles. So um, the dysfunctionality, in my opinion. My analysis is it's more skill based. People lack the skills or for some reason have gone dysfunctional in the skills and how to make it through life. And then that, that's how they end up in trouble. I, I would argue your starting point is somewhere a bit different, which is something goes wrong inside people's heads and then they end up in trouble. I, I, I hope that's a fair assessment of the difference between us. Um, but I don't know what you think, what your thoughts are. Um. I think it's a, 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 a perhaps those a, a positions are slightly different. I think um, uh, I think the book. Um, I don't think it locates illness and distress purely within the individual or the sufferer. Um, when it talks about things like modernity and. Um, difficulties of compassion, uh, perhaps um, the need to sometimes be a bit sceptical and hold our thoughts lightly. Um, I think those are um, those are things that sort of come from the outside, they're kind of socio-cultural beliefs that we've absorbed either from our family or, you know, from the environment that we grew up in. Um, so I don't think it all comes about, uh, or I don't think our position is that the, the, um, uh, the genesis of, um, of illness is um, all within the individual. Neither is, it all, neither is it all in the outside either. You know, we have some agency. Um, yes, of course, we all, we all tread different landscapes, um, and sometimes it's, it's more difficult than others, but um, I think we are uh, somewhat able to um, alter our course and make our lives better. Okay, but, but let's go back to the fact that uh, the problems arise when things are going wrong in people's lives, right? Um, you're, it, very rarely would it be the case that someone's happily married, um, has a loving relationship with their children, that's a great job, blah, blah, blah. We could list all the things that are working and then they have a mental illness, right? Generally speaking, something isn't working somewhere. Now, the argument I suspect between us is where does this all start? I'm arguing it starts because they're doing something that lands them in trouble. And that's 
Therefore, the treatment is learn to be more skilled in how we engage with the world. Um, your the, the point of departure between us is the analysis in um, the book is le learn to handle yourself and quieten your mind and, and not be so distressed. But it doesn't address the point that it, there's some failing going on and frustration that's occurring with the engagement with the world problem. So, for example, let's say someone is upset because they're not earning enough. Your analysis is learn to be more content, let's say, with not earning so much and don't be so obsessed with success. My analysis is if you're not earning enough, learn either to earn more, right, or then learn to be more content with earning less. But, you know, make, make a choice one way or the other. So equally, it could be the case that my therapy would encourage people to be more skilled at asking for a bigger pay rise. And I think your therapy is very unlikely to be suggesting that as an outcome. I could be wrong, though. It might not advocate it as directly as you would, possibly. Um, I think it, uh, I wouldn't like to speak for every psychotherapist. We all have our own slight sort of different ways of working. But um, I think uh, uh, most of us would try and um, uh, allow a client to open up the different possibilities um, and feel like they've got a, a reasonably solid choice and feel quite good about the choice they make. Um, so uh, it wouldn't be as, it would support them on whatever choice they made, but there'd be a sort of precursor step to sort of try and help people um, evaluate their options really, I think. Um, it's, um, it's not wildly different, but it, it might be slightly less sort of, uh, might be slightly less direct, but it's not necessarily passive either. Um, uh, you know, that idea of being able to sort of stop, um, sometimes accept uh, the limitations of life, um, or alternatively not accept them and move on in a sort of quite dynamic way. I think having that sort of period to sort of uh, consider what's available, um, uh, can then allow a sort of uh, almost a kind of momentum from the starting blocks, if that makes sense. Um, but um, it might be a little bit uh, different. It sounds like you might uh, uh, be a little bit more d direct when people are moving through that um, particular door that they've chosen. Maybe as they're moving, they can decide whether it fits them or not. Um, so they don't have to be a sort of slave to their choice. Um, but, um, you know, they can go for it. Well, let me take a practical example, which I see a lot of. You see, I think a large part of, amount of human distress is other people. Other people make people distressed. We, we might call them difficult people, having to deal with a difficult person, a difficult yes. lover, a difficult husband or wife, a difficult boss. So I see kind of a lot of people come in very upset and complaining about a bullying boss, right? Now, I think that where therapy has gone a bit wrong is what those people are looking for is an answer to the bullying boss. Now, I agree with you that sometimes there's very little you can do about a bullying boss, and you should basically get out and find another job or learn to be less distressed by the bullying boss, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes um, you can give advice where people then go back to work, implement an action plan with the bullying boss, and get him to stop bullying you. It, it happens or her. To stop. It, it, yes. there, there's pragmatic solutions to people's problems. And I think that's what they're looking for. And I think where therapy passes them by or where therapy collides with them is therapists don't see that as their job. Therapists don't see that practical problem-solving element to people's lives as being their job as much as I think it really is. But this, I'm out on a limb here, away from the field, as to what the field really thinks it ought to be about. But what are your thoughts? What I'm saying is people have practical problems. Something's gone wrong. A bad thing has happened. And they need practical advice about how to fix the problem. Now, if the problem is different, like your lover's left you and is not coming back, right and and the ther the patient comes and says how do i get my lover back and it's quite clear that would be extremely unhelpful as a project your job as a therapist is to say i really don't think that's such a great idea yes. um but 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 so, so so there's some practical problem solving they're looking for um which which you your job is to explain why that would perhaps be an unhelpful route to go down but for many other cases, it is practical problem solving that actually is the better place for them to be in as, as the action point, I think, more so than therapy 
um, does. And the reason why therapy fights shy of this, it involves taking risks. The minute you give advice saying, well, I think you can handle the bullying boss this way, it's up to you, but one thought is this, you engage in a world of risk because they go and implement the plan and it could go really badly wrong. This is always happens in human affairs. And therapists don't like mm. engaging in that risk, I think. Anyway, what are your thoughts? I may maybe being unfair to therapy. Well, I think the um, uh, uh, the practical minutiae of life um, don't always get brought to therapy, which is a pity. I mean, money is a classic example, isn't it? Money is an enormous part of uh, uh, the stress of life. Um, and actually talking about money, your relationship with money, likewise talking about food, your relationship with food, your relationship with your body, um, relationship with going to the gym, these kind of things are actually quite emotional and they're quite important to talk with a therapist. Um, I agree that sometimes um, psychotherapy, therapy in general, um, can be a bit reticent about encouraging clients that this is okay, we can bring you, you can bring that, and we can talk about it, we can spend a session on it, a number of sessions if that's what's necessary, whether it be dealing with your difficult boss and these, you know, agonizing meetings that happen every week, or dealing with um, the difficulty you have going to, uh, getting out of the house, going to the gym, or whatever it is. Um, I think um, uh, those are things that are suitable for therapy. Most, I think, most contemporary therapists um, uh, would certainly uh, help if the client brought it, brought that issue. Um, probably at the School of Life, we're probably a little bit more encouraging of that um, to try and um, allow clients to bring the things that matter. It doesn't always have to be uh, something by a, uh, I don't know, Socrates or uh, uh, some um, writer, although we do have that a lot in the, in the therapy room. It can also be something very, very specific um, and we can kind of work through it. Um, I think your point about skills is very um, is very useful though. Um, uh, part of the reason I think that the School of Life was set up um, was um, uh, because there was a sort of a deficit in emotional education. Um, uh, the School of Life and Alain de Botton um, wrote a book two or three years ago about that. Um, there are these sort of skills, as you say, that um, uh, are beyond maths, they're beyond English, which are important too. But these are things like handling conflict, being able to deal with somebody who's a domineering person, sidestep, be able to stay light on our feet, not to freeze up, so that we're able to kind of um, negotiate around that, around there. So I don't think I'm in, um, I don't think the outcome probably is that different probably to your, um, uh, to your practice or your therapy, I don't think. Um, perhaps the it might take a little bit longer, um, and perhaps it might not be quite as direct. Um, but I think the the um, the outcome, I think, will probably be relatively similar. Okay, but let's tackle another area which I think is very important with with what mental illness is really about. Is usually, and I'm going to say something very blunt again, which reveals my style. That people have a problem they arrive with, let's say they're being um, in a very unhappy relationship or they have a difficult boss at work or whatever. There's a practical, real event happening out there in the world that is causing distress. I'm going to say something really very tough now. Usually what they need to do is actually blindingly obvious. Okay, They need to leave mm. the extremely unhelpful partner they're with. Okay, At the heart of most psychological and mental illness is that they refuse to do the blindingly obvious or they can't see the blindingly obvious, right? And part of therapy is is actually not actually so much that you have to hand out that complicated advice. It's helping people see the blindingly obvious and helping them leave a relationship, let's say, that has never worked, is never going to work, and is causing them distress. And they believe that if they left that relationship, they wouldn't cope, they wouldn't be able to survive, but they, they do. 
and, and once you help them leave and, and 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 move on. So, in other words, basically, people have to do something they don't want to do. And one of the analogies I give here, basically, the heart of all therapy, is um, the analogy of a spider phobia. The correct treatment, if you have a, such a terrible spider phobia, you don't want to leave your bedroom in case you meet a spider, is you have to confront spiders in a graded manner, all right, and and gradually yes. get used to yes. spiders and become less anxious and stop avoiding them. OK, so basically everyone's got a spider at the heart of all psychiatric dysfunction. They need to confront. I know it's a brutally simple analogy. It doesn't apply yeah. everywhere, but, but there's a deep truth to some extent in that point. So therapy is helping people. And that going back to emotional skills, um, handling the panic, handling the distress of doing something you don't want to do and not letting yourself be a victim of your emotions. And be, your emotions tell you, don't do this thing when actually you really ought to do that. And we might use a term called emotional override. So what about mm. that idea that actually usually people have a problem, it's pragmatic, they need to do something, they're resisting doing it, and the job of therapy is to get them to do it. Well, get them is a, is a very interventionistic, slightly controlling word, but, but help mm. them maybe do a thing that would be to their benefit to do. And one of the failures of therapy is either people are not interventionistic enough because they're scared of saying, it's not my job to tell someone they have to leave this abusive person. They need to come to that conclusion. I will support them getting there. But that's too, in my view, namby-pamby and takes too long. Um, and and, and um, the other thing is you have to help them do the thing. And that means inspire them. The, the mistake with a lot of therapy is that you, you give the advice or the advice is obvious, but you don't really inspire. Inspir inspiring people is something beyond what most psychotherapists are trained to do. They're trained to, to make a diagnosis, deliver advice, but inspiration is something you know beyond the, the techniques of most psychology and psychiatry. And inspiration is in the realm of the arts quite often. Films inspire us or motivate us. And that is another missing thing that therapy doesn't do very well. It doesn't inspire people because it, it's not part of most people's training as therapists. Anyway, over to you. Am I being very unfair or crass for some of the things I'm saying? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, I think they're all sort of um, uh, valid comments about therapy in general, I think. Um, at the School of Life, we, we run an integrated psychotherapy service, so the relationship is very important, but also um, we sort of run the gamut between quite short-term directive work and more uh, longer-term, perhaps explorative work. Um, I think um, how to help clients uh, either change in terms of change the world outside them or change their own internal um, attitudes to the world um, is sort of what psychotherapy is about really isn't it um, from the point of view of the different types of therapy and part of the reason there are so many types is because uh, people are quite different and they resonate with different things so you're right that sometimes the answer is blindingly difficult uh, sorry blindingly obvious um, uh, to another person but to help somebody leave an abusive partner for example um, it can be, it can take years and actually people can turn up in therapy having seen three or four different therapists and some different therapists have tried different things. Sometimes they've been quite direct interventionist and it was too much for that particular client. Um, sometimes that client needs to sort of build up to it in a sense um, and have somebody sort of alongside them. Uh, and sometimes that's not the case. Um, that's part of the reason why um, therapy is so interesting, isn't it? Because different things work for different people. Yeah. Well, let me pick another pragmatic example, which I've seen quite a lot of recently. Someone has met someone for the first time and they're falling in love with each other and they're thinking of committing and, and, and marrying this person. And the, mm -hmm. the person they're falling in love with quite clearly is an extreme alcoholic okay, and drinks very heavily. OK, and, and you can tell straight away that um, th th this alcoholism, unless this other person who's never received treatment goes for treatment or tries to give up, is never going to give up and it's going to end disastrously. And the person falling in love comes to you and asks for advice. And all the information suggests the alcoholic is is hardcore and not going to change. And they just refuse to accept this point. They keep saying, well, I, you know, he tells me he's going to change. He's promised to cut down. 
And whenever this person arrives <laughs> to, to meet the, the, the alcoholic, they're blind drunk, <laughs> you know, at 11 in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So uh, an absolute refusal to see that obviousness. We're dramatically running out of time. But again, what about that point? That, that, that again, um, what, what would a therapist from, an, from the school of life do in that situation, perhaps? I think we'd, I want to try and uncover why there was this sort of big discrepancy. You know, there's somebody who is quite functional and can cope with all sorts of aspects of life. And then there's this area of life where they seem to have sorts of blinkers on, really. And that, you know, sort of not seeing something that everybody else can see. Um, and it might be, and this is very sort of um, related to the school of life view on relationships anyway. I think that um, that person has a, overly romantic view of, of love yeah. and relationships. And that's exactly what I did say to them. I said, this is a romantic view. I'm going to have to stop you right there, Richard, I'm afraid. Course, We've run out yes. of time. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. We've been talking about a book called On Mental Illness uh, by The School of Life. Richard, thank you very much.